let's go. Yeah, we'll, we'll start the meeting at 6.58. And the first thing on the agenda is changes to the agenda. Any changes to the agenda? No? The only thing I would like to request is, is you know, I'm going to go back to this. I brought it up last meeting. Is I do think to offer the public a little more opportunity to discuss things um, in response to new and unfinished business. Um, we have two spots. Whether we limit them in minutes or to accommodate two, but I, I that format when Steve brought it up and did it several meetings ago it worked well in my opinion anybody else i thought when we discussed it we thought that it sort of took up a lot of time from the business and that that one spot Agreed. would be enough yeah. i mean my only comment is if somebody wants to bring up you know to give us a preview of what they would like time to speak with towards the end of the meeting maybe that would be helpful but there is a space at the end of the meeting. But just, you know, if, if you wanted to, you know, give a preview saying, you know, at the end of the meeting, I would like to discuss. Oh, that's what I'm sorry. Just to give us a, okay. to give us a little bit of okay, a preview but I of what we might expect. And we can limit audience. that to five minutes? <coughs> Any opportunity, I think, is good. It's just, it's more inclusive. <clears throat> okay. Um, a, Approve the minutes of the, um, why does this say August 7th? August 7th meeting? Yeah. No. no. September, September 7th. 12th. September 7th meeting, and I only have one correction, and that's under the reports. It's initiating the purchase of the building, and it was the selling of the building. Okay. Anybody else with a correction? Inclusion? No? <clears throat> um, reports, mail, email, there was none. <laughs> Regional Planning Commission, um, they held a new member orientation. A lot of the towns have sent um, either new people or new alternative people um, to be members of the um, Planning Commission. And so they held an orientation and that seemed to go over pretty well. There were a few brownfield grants that went through. We had an audit of um, the Mark organization, and it came out um, quite well. And there will be a written report that's due out in a couple more weeks, um, if anybody's interested in looking at that. Um, one of the things that they're um, discussing is the legislature in Vermont has required all of the regional planning commissions to work together and they want to do things like to come up with some more similar kinds of um, wording and elements for things like land use. Um, and they're just sort of pulling that together. It's really just came out that this is what the legislature wants to happen. And so they're working on that. Um, they're expecting that they, they might have um, in maybe another month or so, a draft about the Act 250 and the exemptions for the Act 250. Um, and they're expecting to have that out in maybe a month or so. And that's it from the Regional Planning Commission. Can I ask you a question? Do you have to approve the minutes with a motion? <gasps> You're right. Okay. <laughs> Back up. So can I have a motion to approve the minutes? Um. Do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. No? Approved. <clears throat> um, the Energy Board, I sent out um, some information about the uh, solar array, and they will be um, given some time. Apparently, the, the Brian, who was the one, he asked for time after 8 o'clock. He said he won't be available until after 8. So we'll, we can move that down to 
I've given him some time after we've discussed our other business. Okay? Um, zoning administrator, I haven't had a report um, except for the one thing that came out late this afternoon that I got out to everybody. And any comments on that? Mark thought that it would be a good idea if we had the whole application and not just the approval? I think that would be helpful. Okay. And that um, the, the, the current one-page approval form should really include the physical address of the, of the, the home site. Um, in the approval? In the approval, instead of having to search um, uh, through state websites or the, the, the database. This one particular on Malagash, there, um, there, I wasn't able to find initially their address for the site because they have a PO box. And so the PO box isn't helpful. Okay. Address. <clears throat> okay, that brings us down to Martha and her suggestions. So, Martha, you got 45 minutes. accessory structure um, in up to 50% of the home, but well, less than 50% because it is, it's accessory to the home being a home, so it should be less than 50% of the living space, but there was some discussion about how much of an accessory structure could also be used for a home-based business. Um, one question I had after thinking about the discussion last time was, um, what, what, it, what would be the hesitation in allowing someone to use, you know, like the entire garage or the entire barn if that's what they were proposing for their business? Is it a, is it a noise or is it, what, I guess I just wanted to understand better what the what the concerns were. If they if it was something like noise or emissions or some other concern, then you could deal with that with um, you know uh, performance standards. I think some of it was the parking issue, and right. if the parking went on to the into street parking and the avail availability of emergency vehicles to get by on the narrow roads. Right. If it was some kind of a humongous yard sale or something. Right. Or whatever the business might be that they were having some sort of a big sale, a Columbus Day sale, and 75 people showed up parking all over the place. Right. And I think that was one of the concerns. <laughs> Oh, definitely parking was one, and but there seemed to be discussion also about an accessory structure and whether that should be, whether someone would be allowed to use the entire thing or they should use 50%. Yeah, I think I think my concern is is that you know if we're talking about a home-based business, anytime you are sort of extending the definition of the home, so it's it's an outbuilding, it's an accessory building, it's parking. This true sense of a home business is now, there's now sprawl. And I'm worried that, and concerned that this home-based business might be using quite a bit of the outdoors mm -hmm. in some sort of capacity. Mm -hmm. um, so um, when you have you know, a portion of the home and now an outbuilding, and now a pasture or a field, 
um, and roadside. This is becoming a little more of just a basic home business. Okay. Martha, I think your suggestions, um, there are so many variables. I mean, it's just limitless from one extreme to the other. So if we aligned it with the state and then if it becomes a conditional use, then <clears throat> when they come to us for an application, then we can be proactive and constructive and allow parameters for that specific use when it's presented to us. I, I just don't think we can have, we can list pages and pages and pages of regulations and requirements. We'll be here forever mm -hmm. trying to do that. Where if we, an application is presented to us, you know, I think we can be constructive with the applicant and say, okay, your bathrooms, if you're having portable restrooms, need to be X amount of feet off the pathway. You can't, like, like Kathy, very good point. You can't have a big sale and clog up an artery that p prevents emergency vehicles from gaining access to properties there and after. So I, I think we could take it on a case-by-case -case basis without creating pages of regulation that are going to become very difficult and could become very challenging for the town. Right. Yes. So, so like, um, so maybe on the parking part of it, where, um, <clears throat> I, comment. I was suggesting that you eliminate the word customer and then just reference the parking section. And then when you have an actual application in front of you and you're going through conditional use, if the person indicates that the business is likely to have a heavy customer component, um, then you can talk about it at that point. And, so know. Martha, when, when do we get to the point where we need to separate what is a true commercial enterprise and what is simply a home-based business? Because in looking at some of the other municipalities around Vermont, they, you know, they, they, they will address customers and they will say there's only so many customers that should be coming a day. You know, whether it's a few, it's a few clients, it's somebody who's getting their hair done, it's somebody getting a massage, you know, that's that's a true home-based business. But if it is somebody requiring um, somebody requiring extensive parking or extensive um, land or expensive, extensive traffic, then I think that that becomes, you know, a concern. I understand the conditional piece, but you know, somebody might really argue this is a true home-based business, and somebody else might say this this is a brick-and-mortar commercial enterprise that has dozens and dozens of consumers coming throughout the day, even though it's based at a home. Right. Um, I could really see the the the, the fabric of the landscape changing um, if we don't have some specific parameters well i mean right now you you can only have three additional on-premise employees who aren't residents you can change that to two you know you probably have help a little bit in reducing the potential size of the business um, you can specify less than 50 percent of the living space of the home and less than 50 percent of the existing accessory structure space, you could say existing, which would mean what's already there, so they don't want to put up a huge warehouse or... So the other element too is if we are speaking about home base, you know, the state makes it pretty clear, I don't know if people are honest in reporting, but make it very clear that a certain percentage can be used for business while still allowing a homestead exemption. Mm -hmm. If not, then the home becomes a business and um, that's not what the intention of the... It's not a business with a home attached, it's a home with a business. <laughs> Correct, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. That's partly the reason for the less than 50% of the dwelling. You could lower that. Um, less than 40% and two additional employees. Um, you know, it, those things are up to you guys. 
those are not set in stone by the state. My, my question would be, do we have a run on of these types of situations that are changing the landscape of Reading? Because I see businesses leaving instead of coming. I think we've had some issues in the past where there's been really loose interpretation of what is a business, what is a recreation, what is um, a hobby, and um, other municipalities have, you know, they have the conditional use, but they have sort of a, a, a list, whether it's a landscaping business where somebody is simply just parking their equipment, or there is a beauty salon, or there's somebody performing massages, or somebody who has a quilt shop, um, uh, um, relatively low impact <coughs> home occupations. Well, like, you know, I mean, 50% of <coughs> 2,000 square feet is quite a bit of room for a home-based business. That's, that's half of your living space. Right. Um, well, that's why I'm, that's a, just a suggestion, you know, mm -hmm. that I think is actually based on your prior, let me look at your prior one. Oh no, your prior one was silent on the percent, so... Um, the prior one did say three additional employees, but like I said, you can make it two. The prior one said not have external storage visible. Really st still says the same thing, it's just mm -hmm. differently worded. Off-street parking, that's the same, it just spells out re business, resident, customer, employee, you can just get rid of customer since that was kind of the wild card in the discussion last time. And then you'll deal with that when you have conditional use review. Reduce this to 30% or 40% of the living space. And then, like I said, you can also mention the performance standards. They are mentioned in under home occupation, so it makes sense to reference them here as well. I mean, you. I would think you wouldn't want noise and mm -hmm. emissions and mm -hmm. explosions or whatever, you know, whatever. <laughs> There's a whole lot of things listed there. Okay, so the way I'm understanding it, okay, occupy an, an accessory structure that is located on the lot and that has no qualifier for size. The next thing addresses specifically the house and it says, or a portion of the dwelling that includes less than 50% of the total living space. So what we need is a qualifier for the accessory structure. Is that the issue? Uh, you know, again, that's up to you, whether you wanted to allow an entire accessory structure, part of an accessory structure. Well, I think that was part of it, because if right. the accessory structure is enormous, right. and it's four times what 50% of the living space is, that's not our intent. So I think there needs to be a qualifier maybe for the, um, the accessory structure. What mark would align us with, with the state? They, as far as I'm aware, they don't have specific criteria for home-based businesses. They allow you to. Because I think this is, this is the fine line that I'm seeing with this discussion is, is the, if we do not align ourselves with the state, the states, if anyone challenges us based on rules that have been established for no verifiable reason, <clears throat> then we don't have the state's backup. If we align ourselves with the state, we have the full support of the state to back us up. Well, they also want you to align yourself with your town plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, you take a look at that. I haven't looked at it recently, but... You know, one of the things that could happen is somebody wants to open up a daycare, which is great, we need a lot of daycares. However, if they have a small Cape home and they put up an enormous structure for a daycare with indoor playgrounds and everything... Although I think something like that is pretty regulated. I yeah, mean, that's yeah, one of the... Yeah, yeah, you know, that would be regulated. Um, well, it kind of depends on if they do it as an FCC home or not. Well, if family it, child care home, if it's a yeah, if it's a certain size, they're allowed to do that. If it gets bigger than six full time or four mm -hmm. part time kids, then then it's a facility and it would go through conditional use. 
Kurt, do you have anything to add? Um, I'm not bashful about maintaining our own specific standards uh, as opposed to, you know, looking to the state. Um, I do think that as much of this stuff as we can make a conditional use, the better. That gives us the chance to, to really have an input. Um, that's my thought. Well, it is conditional in all the districts, so that's a given. These are yeah. just, these are just additional, you know, criteria. Which I just feel like there should be some sort of threshold, basic, so that when the conditional, not if, but when the conditional use review comes up, that certain certain proposals are not seen as favorable because of certain situations and some that might be rejected. Um, we don't want to get into the legal battles that we have recently. Mm -hmm. Well, you can, you know, also look at your conditional use standards. We can do that over the next year and a half or so. Mm -hmm. and are you, I mean, certain of, some of those are spelled out, mm -hmm. what they are, but there is some, you can, you can borrow some things from Act 250 and add those to your conditional use standards if you want to, um, that's allowed. I would think that conditional use permit process would give the applicant and us and the townspeople a lot of time to sit down and hash out all the concerns. And I think the one issue, the legal situation that we've had in, I don't know, decades that I can remember, you know, was a lot of knee-jerk reaction that inflamed into this really crazy situation um, that none of us felt comfortable with. But if we could have an open mind when we get these applications and have more of a, a, a town hall setting to where we can discuss what our concerns are, what some of the conditions would be going forward if we were to allow something to happen, then it, it gives the town, the people of town, ample time to discuss and create conditions, and then we can go through the hearing process and say, you know, this is the criteria if you want to move forward. If they want to challenge it at that point, then they can challenge it at that point, or they can be constructive and allow us all the opportunity to discuss a common goal instead of just saying no because if we keep just saying no we are going to get challenged i can guarantee it you know what i think most of the legal problems we had with chase and everything um were a result of the select board starting the whole process um mm -hmm. on their own and uh and then, you know, their new math that four days equals three and all that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> to the degree we can keep stuff open in, in, in our purview uh, and have a process that, you know, even the select board realizes they have to go through would be helpful. Maybe it's worth looking at home-based businesses as so basic that anybody that wouldn't fit under the basic parameters would then need to really expect to go through a conditional review process because it's going to involve you know a significant amount of outdoor space, accessory building, greater than 30% of a home use. Um, I mean, they're, go they're going to go through conditional. Use. They're going to anyway, anyway. I mean, so, but just yeah. you know, if, yeah. if somebody is if somebody expects that they might have a, a more involved process to present to the board what they want to do, um, that you know, it's not just something that's simply you know a sign behind closed doors, very minimal, very very minimal impact to neighbors and to traffic. Um, 
those are those are my thoughts. Is just going through these one by one so I know where you stand. Are you do you like the idea of having three additional employees in addition to the person who owns the home? Or would you rather lower that? Mark, what do you think? Two or three? I, I think three is reasonable. Okay, I'm with three. Kurt, what do you think? Two or three? Three, I think three is reasonable. Stacy? Uh, three or, or whatever it takes. I, I, it's a great time for me to say, I'm just, the more regulations, the more headaches we're going to have in the future. Okay. So well, you could have a home-based business with 100 employees, and that's, that, that, that's going to be a real commercial enterprise. Well, I don't is. think that would be considered a home-based business. I don't think anyone would think that. There's a lot of elasticity in a lot of this. I think it, it, you know, it could. Okay, so we don't change it. Okay, it remains three. We'll keep that three. We'll yeah. keep that three. Okay, so the next one is to screen all storage of supplies or equipment from any adjacent highway or dwelling unit with fencing or landscaping. Anybody object to that? No. Kurt? It's reasonable. Stacy um, said no. Kurt? I, in theory, I agree, but I mean, if somebody's got a pickup or a snow plow on a park in the driveway, No, I don't think so either. I think that's like that's his own personal thing that doesn't have anything to do with a home based business, I don't think. What if he has I mean, three trucks around and other people's driveways? I mean, it's, yeah. A, yeah, it's but a, it's not at his house. But it's a, number four says employee vehicle, so one could say the employee vehicle is, is the plow or is the, the tractor or is the van. So we okay with number two? Mark? I am. Kurt? Yeah. Okay. Number three is the one that's giving us some heartburn hurt here. Occupy an accessory structure located on the lot or a portion of the dwelling that it includes less than 50% of the total living space. Do we want to put a qualifier in for the accessory structure? Do we want to keep it at 50? Do we want to lower it to 40? Do we want to take it out altogether? Ideas? We should have a percentage in there, just. Both or only for one, Kurt? For both or only for one? Should 50% of the total living space also apply to an accessory structure? Okay, Mark? I'm, I'm not sure. This is, this is tough. I would eliminate it. Okay. I'm there for adding the, the same 50% of the total living space to the accessory structure. And we can visit that again next time, I guess. And the 50% is, you want to stick with 50%? Of the total living space? I think that's, I think that's a little too generous in terms of the living space. If we're, if we're anticipating that this is, this is going to be a true home-based business and not something else that sprawls outside and larger. Uh, yeah. And again, Martha, there's no requirement on this by the state. As far as I know. Okay. Yeah. So, you, would you, I mean, would everyone, setting aside the accessory structures from, for the time being, less than 40% of the living space of the home? Is that something that everyone agrees with? Or? No. What is the regulation for federal income tax for getting that thing for a home-based office? What do the feds say on that? Anybody? Sure. I can't call it right now. I'm not sure, but like, I mean, technically the home-based business, it could be an office, it could be a bathroom, it could be a studio, it could, it could be something else. It's not just 
you know, where you meet a client or operate your computer. Um, right, but there's a, there's a percentage. There is it's a percentage. a percentage of the home, and I can't call it right now. But that may be associated with the home occupation, which you all have already said is exempt, provided it you know meets your criteria. It, you know, and that and that yeah. depends on how they. You know, I would let them deal with their tax implications because yeah. different. No, I was just wondering for a, just a yeah. sort of ballpark for the percentage of the home. Are you talking from a tax perspective? Yes. Oh. Do you know it offhand? I, I don't know it offhand, but I believe it's calculated based on total living I, I space. Don't, I don't think it's. I think it's like 25% yeah. or 20%. I, I was thinking it's based 30, on the use. I wasn't sure. It's based on the use. I think it's 20%. 20? Maybe we should look at so that. We'll, or just go with the 50 or the 40 or whatever. 50%? That seems a lot of your house to have for a business. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that so many of the homes in Reading can dedicate 50% of their living space to a business. That seemed like a lot? It seems like a lot to me, from living space to bedrooms um, to Yeah, kitchen. in a kitchen and a living room, and then where do you put your other 50% of your business? Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, Kurt, <laughs> does Kurt have a few thoughts on the percentage? Kurt, what do you think about the, the percentage of the total living space? I'd be okay with 40. We also, have, we have, also had accessory dwellings that we say can't be 40% of the main house. 40% seems, mm -hmm. seems like that might be a, a reasonable amount. Okay, Mark 40. Kurt 40? Yeah. Stacy 40? No. No. Me 40. So 40%? And we still have to talk about the accessory structures thing. <clears throat> Moving on to number four, the provide off-street parking for all business, resident, customer, and employee vehicles. And comply with section 3.8, the signs. Are we okay with the off-street parking part? I had suggested removing yeah. customer because that yeah. was the kind of the contentious what okay, so you wanted issue. to do what, Martha? You could remove customer and then just reference the section of the regulations that have to do with parking. Resident and employee vehicles? Right. Bus well, business, resident, and employee vehicles. I mean, business is going to be deliveries or it could be customers. Either way, customers are going to be coming. So I, even though I'm really um, worried about the number of customers that could be at a home-based business, I think it's ultimately going to come up or be interpreted under business. So, it wouldn't be customer, a business if it didn't have customers. customers. What's that? It wouldn't be a business if it didn't have customers. It's, well, it's true, yeah. At least in-person customers. It could be a virtual customer. So do we want to delete customer? I don't think it serves any purpose to delete it. So leave it in there? Mark? I, th I think leave it in it. I, I, Martha, I'm, leave more, it in. I'm more concerned that the number of it's customers does. Yes, <laughs> it's going to come up anyway. So. Yep. Kurt, leave customers in? Yeah. Stacy, customers no. in? No. No? No. Customers in, I guess. You're leaving it and in then, or you're not leaving? You're leaving it in or you're yeah, not yes. leaving it in? Okay. And comply with 3.8 signs? Yes. And I don't think that was any. It's quite a modest size. Something. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't think there's ever been anybody coming in with any big thing for signs. But we do have a lot about signs. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, now, multi-unit dwellings, you decided not to make any changes. 
Uh, what about the nursery? I think nursery, we agreed nursery. We already did that one? We agreed with that last time. Okay. So I don't know if you, there's any need for more discussion on multi-unit dwellings or... We can go back to accessory dwellings where there was some disagreement about owner occupancy, um, owner occupancy and number five, neither the single family home nor the accessory dwelling unit is offered as a short term rental. Where, where are we at? Uh, 4.1? 4.1, accessory dwellings. <coughs> accessory apartments. Uh, detached. Like accessory dwelling units. Kathy, Ray is asking to say something. Oh, did, uh, did we just skip over multi-unit dwellings? We had discussed that in the last meeting, Ray. Um, and yeah, and I, I had uh, commented, um, and Mark was sent me back a response. Um, but I, I had some questions um, regarding that. I mean, I, I'm amazed at the language in, in the Act that says bylaws should designate appropriate districts and reasonable regulations. Who's, who's making those decisions? Well, that's the that's a state law right. that, that you have to designate. Yeah, but if we but if we adopt that for for ours, then we're putting the same language in there. So if it's ready, who's going to make the decision that something is reasonable or not? Well, no, I you think you already have that's it the listed. Thing with that, that act, um, the new act, you can't a town can't go against the state on that. <clears throat> That's been established. I, I'm, I'm not actually saying we go against it. I'm just saying, who, who's going to do it? Who, who's the party that's going to make the decision, decision whether something is reasonable? You, well, you already have multi-unit dwellings listed as a conditional use under some of the districts. You have it under um, RR5, R1, RCA, and RCB. And so there's no proposal to change what you already have. Okay, and the other, the other thing I had asked about was the fact that it states below that um, in any district that is served by municipal sewer and water, mm -hmm. and you referred me back to the, to the beginning of this, I, I'm just, I, I question whether or not you could have a four or five family unit and build a septic system that would support four or five units. I tried to look that up in the sewer regulations, and there's nothing in there that even comes near discussing having a multi-family on a septic system. Just the design of the septic system for a single-family home is extremely complex. It has to be done by a, 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 a licensed designer, etc., etc. So I, I don't even know if a licensed designer can design a septic system for a four or five family. Oh, well, I think they, it could. I mean, they it would depend that. on the lot. If it was a big enough lot, it could presumably accommodate a, a septic Soil system. Soil condition. Which would only be RR5 in terms of well, it what could, we... What right. It could be in, the, in one of the villages if there's an existing lot that's right. big enough that has the right, right kind of soils and... But I mean, in terms of a sewer system, the state would be heavily subsidizing any sort of sewer system that a municipality would 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 put in. Therefore, the push to have a multi-unit dwelling would be, you know, significant. They in 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 areas that can handle that, you know, that the, the, the that does have the sewer, then they want some they want some density. They want some housing. Um, available. But you don't have sewer and water, so you don't have to worry about the state telling you that you have to have a multi-unit dwelling. Right. Right, right now. In right. towns that have public sewer and water, then they are 
I'd say you have to allow what is it four or five? Right. Three, three or four. Yeah, but I, we're we're exempt from that because we're a rural community without public. Right. And I, I think theoretically a developer could go to Act 250 and apply for an Act 250 permit with the appropriate sewage design by an engineering firm. And if Act 250 and the state deemed it appropriate, and I think, I think what your concern is, is still, until the reform happens, still governed by Act 250. Okay. And it's a very arduous process. Okay. Yeah, I just didn't understand the point with the language regarding it. It was understood what about uh, it used had to be owner occupied. We're, this is yeah, what we're discussing. Yeah, we're going to get back to that if, if, if Ray's okay with the multi unit dwelling. Um, so we talked about changing your, you had accessory apartment language right now and you had separate language for whether they're um, attached or detached and so the proposed language combines those so it's just one discussion on accessory dwelling units regardless of whether they're attached or detached um, uh, but the state requires that you allow an accessory dwelling unit if the home is on an owner-occupied lot. So, so it so has Martha, to be a permitted use right. if it's on an owner-occupied So what we, so it, it seems like you didn't have an answer the last time. Owner-occupied, there are some, there are some municipalities that say owner-occupied is simply you own the property full stop and you know you occupy the house the adu is the adu then there are some that say owner occupied means a full-time resident which would then mean non you know the homestead exemption um does the state have a owner occupied as far as i know they don't define it which so, is probably uh, why you're seeing different definitions sure. in different towns so you know in that case i don't know then i think it may be we should consider, you know, uh, defining that. I personally just think owner occupied is you are the owner of the property, and if you have an ADU, the expectation is that you live on the property as the owner, whether you are a full time resident or a part time resident, you are the owner. Some might feel differently. I don't believe it should be, if the owner-occupied sh language should be used. If the state doesn't outline that, then I don't think it's our right to outline that. Mark, were you saying for both attached and detached? I, th we, I think we should, no, we yeah, for the same, I think because that's going to be the ADU. I think that we need to define what is, what is owner-occupied and then I mean, I know we'll certainly look at the minutia. I think that unless you're offering, you know, tax exemptions or tax rebates, I, I think it's sort of unbelievable that you can say you have an ADU that you can't, you know, you, you can, there are parameters to how, in the way in which you rent them, unless you're getting, you know, monies from the state or the, the local level to, to do that. Well, number five, which is a, I think the one about not offering it as a short-term rental, that's not required by the state. That, that's what I was hearing from you all back in the spring about wanting to limit short-term rentals. So, um, so number five is optional. Bill, you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to understand. So, can ADU be a rental unit? Yes. I, I, I get a, a rental unit or something for your family. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, fundamentally, I, it is a it's a rental unit. <laughs> guest cottage. Yeah. The only reason I bring that issue up is I I also don't think it matters whether who owns or how you occupy the principal unit. The whole discussion statewide for the last few years is all about how do we create 
create more housing units in a desperate environment. Sure. And those are needed as rentals. Yes. So as long as long those, term, long term rentals. Correct. And this That's is what I couldn't agree with you more. So as long as those ADUs can be rented long term, it contributes to the lessening of the uh, crisis we have currently. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, and there's no restriction in the proposed language against renting them. I mean, that, that is what the state is trying to encourage. So the restriction was on renting them as a short-term rental. But again, think, that's just, that's an optional provision. It's not. But not required by the state. Not required by the state. And I think the keys to the valley, um, and for thank you for that link, Kathy, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I was doing some some review of it, and you know, all of it. You know, the barriers include high cost of land, high cost of construction, both in labor and materials, limited number of housing developers and building trades, lack of financing for construction, homes available and not affordable to many household incomes, in migration of high higher household incomes, state regulatory barriers. And then the one that really stood out to me is local regulatory barriers and common opposition, community opposition. I think that's, that's the thing we're butting our heads up with constantly in Reading is there's a group wishing to have more local regulations and based on a minimum community opposition. So to add more regulations to you know, these the owner occupied and ADUs just counteracts what the state and what the Upper Valley needs, which is more <clears throat> affordable housing. Well, I think the state is trying to encourage more affordable housing. They are trying to but, yeah. encourage it, absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. Even the Keys to the Valley and the, the three, the three um, organizations that are working, Mark being one of them, and then two in New Hampshire, I believe. I mean, just one thing I would say, I mean, I, I, I recognize the need for affordable housing, but in terms of regulation, I, I also seem, I, I, I resist a lot of it, but um, there has been a lot of damage done in this town, in particular, the acquisition of homes, the destruction of homes, uh, losing small lots that are buildable sites that have since been turned into land use, and now we're going to be donated to the state. We will never get those homes back. We will never get these affordable homes or sites back. So in terms of the, the regulations, there have been too many sleepy people for too long, too many quiet people for too long, and we're never going to get that back. So we sort of have what we have now, and I think we have an opportunity to hopefully do the right thing in this way, but um, there, <laughs> it, 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 there has been so much damage that has been done. <laughs> um, so, Martha, I was going to ask you in terms of the ADUs, I mean, can there be, there's already expectations with like economic development corporations or the state that if you receive monies, and to build an ADU that then, you know, there's some sort of restrictive covenant that you have to rent it at market rate right. and that you can, you know, for so many years right. and you can't do short-term rental. Right. I mean, is it possible to do language when you're receiving those type of, uh, you know, that type of um, assistance that, that you are required to do that? And then if just somebody else decides to build an ADU that wants to do short-term rentals or shorter-term things that they are allowed to do that. You can just take number five out. I mean, that's that's not required. Just take out that neither the single-family home or the accessory dwelling unit is offered as a short-term rental. Just a brief footnote. Uh, I mean, most of the funders and finances affordable housing, which is really the finance 80% of the 
county median, which is about 72,000. So we're not talking poor people, we're talking reasonably well off people. But the funders and finances will put the covenant restrictions in there to protect long term affordability. It's not the thing I think you need to do to resolve it. And if, and if you do apply for a grant and receive a grant, you are regulated for five years under mm -hmm. that grant, and you have limits to which you can rent out, creating a more affordable housing environment. And you don't have to put that in your zoning, it would just automatically. Right. I just feel like if we want to be promoting this, that you know the town needs to get involved and be a little more aggressive in terms of what sort of care are we going to throw people? Is there going to be some sort of tax rebate? Is there going to be some sort of um, additional exemption? I know nobody wants to think about raising taxes. Is there going to be some sort of levy on, you know, <laughs> uh, 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 real estate sales transactions to, to fund some of this? I'm just, I'm just wondering if you've encountered any, any of that. Well, I mean, not specifically. I personally had an idea that, you know, maybe at some point you're, with your zoning fees, you could set some of that aside. Mm -hmm. You know, perhaps. But, uh, the amount of fees you could collect in the town of Small wouldn't be meaningful, right. sorry, but they wouldn't be in a closet. You, know, you yeah. just. Right. You, you really have to rely upon the producers of affordable housing. That they're, they're, they're really only two in our, our mm -hmm. world is Twin Pines, and it's Windsor, uh, help me out with that one, Martha, one is Vigo. Yeah, but we're in that attachment phase. They're the ones who produce the units, nobody else does in small towns. And it's tough for a small town to compete if you're up against Hartford, which has got sewer and public transit. So it's just, we're in a mind. Mm -hmm. And small incentives are not going to get us over those hurdles. They're just not. I mean, it's, it's just too expensive to develop it. I mean, to build a, a small house is, is, you know, not inexpensive. Look at what they have invested in the little house that used to be Black Horse Realty. Yeah. I mean, they would... I what, think what's going to drive the development of ADUs in a town like ours is the aging population. If I need to build an ADU to attract some younger individual or couple, in exchange for lower rent, they provide some sort of support to me in my home, that's what's going to drive this. It's one of the demographic drive. And if I can afford to put up a 750 square foot ADU on my property that meets all the requirements, that's what's going to drive it. And a wastewater, and a wastewater system. Because just in, in terms of updating, upgrading, resetting, septic okay. regulations, you know, grandfathered systems. <laughs> you might live long enough that I don't think I will. <laughs> and Bill, I am kind of spearheading this in, in a way I'm, I'm going to put in an ad spoken to Callista, I have to speak with the select board about um, getting the aging population who have maybe larger homes or people who have larger homes who want to add an accessory dwelling in and don't have the wherewithal to go through the process. Um, I'm going to work on being a navigator to help those people get these grants and do the work. So there will be an ad in the informer next month um, about that trying to see what type of interest we have in the local community. Yeah. I mean, is that in conjunction with like Aging in Place, that organization? It could be, actually. It that's a very good idea, idea because I, I was just in touch with Sarah. And I think that is a brilliant idea. I can speak to her about that. She would know better than anyone who would be up for it. Mm -hmm. One thing the state's trying to do is to get towns to reduce the barriers that may be in place to doing these sorts of things. So they kind of were first encouraging towns to reduce those barriers, reduce your lot size, reduce your setbacks, reduce your parking requirements. And then they passed Act 47 and just kind of said, well, we were encouraging you and now we're telling you. So, but you know, I mean, it that's, that's what you can do, regardless of you know how much money you have to encourage. You know the, the money is going to come from the state grants and whatnot for fixing up empty apartments or creating new apartments. It's uh, Stacy. Why are you gearing this only to older people? Oh, to meet anyone. I'm not gearing it to older people. And that's the, the only the only reason I brought that up is because Gene. 
made that comment. I did. It certainly doesn't have anything to do with age. Anything. In fact, you to use a, the typical target market the first time. People are just looking to get into a rental unit, affordable rental unit, so not typically. I mean, it could be, but the real barrier is going to be cost of construction. I don't know if anybody can build less than 350 bucks a square foot these days and be looking at a 750 square foot ADU. It's 262,000 to put that unit up. Absolutely. That's, right. That's the barrier. And the state's only offering $50,000 grants. Yeah, so, I mean, this is not a perfect solution. No. Yeah, I don't know that. Yeah, there's no magic bullet, I think, that the town would have. It seems like it's a vicious cycle in a way that the people that you need to work, the reason, part of the reason why it's so expensive, because we just put a big addition on my house so I know the cost of everything, is that getting people to work is expensive. And uh, so the vicious cycle is there's nobody living here that would do the work because they can't afford to live here. So, you know. Well, you drive from Claremont and Springfield well, and Rutland and. Okay. You have to do what you have to do. Exactly. Right. Exactly. But I'm just saying that it's because, you know, it's a vicious cycle. You need people to work that live here and work here. So, <clears throat> so what the state law said is that if you have an owner occupied lot with a single family home, you have to allow an accessory dwelling unit. They don't want people denying accessory dwelling units that's a permitted use. It doesn't say that you can you can't be less restricted than that. You can be less restricted than that. So how you define owner occupancy or whether you want to require owner occupancy or maybe if it's not owner occupied it's a conditional use. I mean there's a variety of things you can do. It's just telling what what the what their you know bottom line is for permitted uses. Mm -hmm. And again, it doesn't require owner occupancy. It's it, yeah. It's the it's kind of it's saying if it is owner occupied, you have to allow it. But it's not saying you can't allow it if it's not. So it would behoove somebody to be owner occupied. It, it's up to you what you say in your regulations. At a minimum, you, you have to say that if it's owner occupied, then it's a permitted use. But you can be less restrictive than that, just as you are with the definition, where instead of saying 30% and 900 square feet, you say 40% and 1,000 square feet. But I don't know if you have consensus on where you are with with that. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's something that we can, you know, just can maybe we hear the pros to. and cons of owner occupied, or what is good about owner occupied? I think we have to define not. owner occupied. If it's if it's just simply that you know somebody owns owns the home. No. I'm saying the pros and cons, like why is it good to have it or why do you not need to have it? I think the pros, I mean, the more people you have living in town who are involved in the school, the community, uh, the better, you know, you don't want absentee landlords. I mean, that's essentially, if it's, if it's not owner occupied, right? Somebody has a home and they're absentee landlord and ADU is, has the renter. Right. Okay. There can be problems you with have that. An opposing viewpoint, right? I, I, I don't have an opposing viewpoint. I, I just don't believe we need to have the restriction of it being owner occupied. No, I agree. I I also agree with that. Yeah. I, I mean, if this, if you are getting monies to build an ADU, then you have to be right. owner occupied. Of course. Of course. 
so Oops. that's um, that that goes without saying. I just think I just in what I spoke to before, I think some of the damages and some of the things that have happened in this town are not linked to short term rentals or you know ADUs not being owner occupied. I think we've had a land grab for a long time. I think we've had you know restrictive zoning that has created larger parcels that which makes it impossible to have small parcels to, to build on. All the small parcels have been spoken for or acquired. So this proposed definition for owner occupied talks about inhabiting the residents more than 50% of the year, which is not saying they've got to be there all the time. Where's this definition coming from? Uh, this is, I, just, I created this definition. Oh. Um, I think, think that's a general definition in other states, you know, as far as if you can vote in that state or whatever. It's one day more than Well, that's a, a definition between residents and non-residents, not owner occupancy. Right, but I'm... And where are you and while this, is, this, this isn't like verbatim from the tax department, I mean, this is the general standard that they use right. to determine whether you pay homestead taxes or non-residential taxes. It's, Kathy, it's 8 o'clock. We should get Bill involved in yep. this presentation. But the owner-occupied, Martha, you suggested, because I can't find it here offhand, oh. you suggested a definition of what? used as the primary residence of the person owning title to the property who must inhabit the residence more than 50 percent of the year and must be eligible to declare the property as a homestead for vermont property tax purposes and you're thinking that's in what we have here someplace no no, no. okay she's just, she's just this pulling this right. definition from someone okay it doesn't exist so, as Stacy just reminded, it's eight o'clock, and I see, is that Brian who's at the bottom there? It is. Hi there. Yep. I wanted to announce myself, but I didn't want to interrupt the proceedings. So. Yep. So Hello, everybody. Let's, yep. Hey, let's, Brian. If we look at the next thing, this is a, we have a motion from the um, Energy Board. Um, about the solar array. <clears throat> and so, Brian, do you want to talk, or Bill, or who's gonna? Brian's the lead. Brian. Hey, Bill. <laughs> uh, sure, we, we can tag team on this as needed. Um, I think the, first of all, let me just ask, have people received the background information that I sent Kathy that has the text of the letter with it and the uh, definition of a preferred site? Does everyone on the planning commission have that? Yep, I forwarded it to everyone. Yeah. Okay, great, good, excellent. So then this uh, should be hopefully fairly straightforward. It's basically um, in order for the town owned array to qualify for the highest level of net metering reimbursement, that is price paid by GMP per kilowatt hour for the amount of excess energy that goes into the grid off of the solar array after the firehouse meets all of its needs. In order to qualify for the highest rate for that, uh, the uh, site needs to be designated a preferred site. And so there's a bunch of different ways that you can be declared a preferred site. Uh, the most straightforward of which is actually what we fall into the situation of, which is that the site that was chosen, uh, A, uh, well, as in the definition that I put there, would be basically a site that had already been selected per the town plan as a preferred site per the energy plan, uh, the enhanced energy plan, which was in fact the case uh, for Reading. The last town plan that was approved had behind the firehouse as one of the uh, sites. Uh, so it's that or, uh, but we're going to do, we're, we're hoping for and, which is and uh, the uh the planning commission from Reading, the select board, 
and the uh, Regional Planning Commission all sign a letter that says that they think that it's a preferred site. Um, so uh, I, it's a little circular here because it's already been designated preferred site, but I just want to like make sure we do this uh, and and have no question about that. So the draft letter that you have before you is something that I put together uh, that's basically just reflecting exactly that. It was modeled off of similar letters that have been used uh, by the chosen solar provider, uh, solar installer Catamount that provided it and I modified it for our situation. Uh, and the goal would be to have that signed by the three authorities. So here I, I started with the planning commission since we are a subcommittee of the, the uh, planning commission as the energy board and thought we'd go from there. Although Martha, I might be able to kill two birds here, <laughs> but you're, you're third in line. Okay. I'll stop talking. Any questions? No. No. Sounds fantastic. Can, uh, can, okay. okay, great. So do I hear a motion that um, we go ahead and sign the letter to the Public Utility Commission for Aye. the Planning Commission for the Solar Array? Aye. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nope. So it's passed. Did somebody second it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Who's going to second it? I'll second, second it. <laughs> so I just have a question. It said it's looking for a signature and then it says by. What does by mean? Is that the date? Oh, it's just to put the name of the person spelled out so that the, if the signature is not legible, even if it is, uh, okay. it just says. So I can yeah, sign yeah. this tonight and I'll put it in the um, mailbox for Callista to bring to the select board meeting. All right. Consider I would appreciate it. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you You're welcome. welcome. Thank, Thank you, you for the work that you've very done. Oh, You're very welcome. I think it's going to be great. That's the salt. So. Oh, yeah. Yep. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. All righty. So next on the agenda is a discussion of the budget. So I have some questions and need to bring some things up and I will be listening to whatever anybody else has in the way of questions or comments on the budget. Do we, are, are we done with the bylaw modernization grant discussion? Yeah, or? for tonight, yes. For tonight? Because okay. we have, we had the energy commission, okay. we've got our budget to do, plan okay. uh, other business and comments and then it's going to be nine o'clock. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Anything hit anybody as far as the budget goes? Okay, so here are my thoughts. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that we um, increase the recording secretary stipend by 5%. Yes. And it's not a big deal, it's three dollars, okay? Don't I, I, would, I, would, uh, I, 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 would, I would do 65 a meeting. I think that that's, I think that that's a nice okay. even number. 65 very fair. a meeting and then the recording secretary stipend for special meetings will bump that to 65 also that's reasonable this is for jane right yes yeah. um <laughs> postage <laughs> and extra hearing expense 300 i think we should keep that the way it is okay, okay so this is where it gets sticky this is um, computer operated and Zoom host, and that was eight hearings um, at $60 an event. That was when we just had the um, Zoom and we had Jerry to be doing the Zooms to be able to give him some kind of compensation. Since Okimo has taken over, and they would be willing to do not only you know our things, but any special hearings that we have, I think that we should take that $480, bump it up to $500, and make it a donation to, because there was no charge for Okemo Valley to come. And it would be a donation to their, five, their 5013C, and it would be a donation to them for their time and efforts to come to the meetings. Excellent idea. I think that's... I mean, it's, and I'm ignorant. It's possible to do it. It's possible to do it. 
we can only submit the budget and we'll see if okay. the select board approves. All right. That's, that's all we can do. So five, 500? Yes. Okay. And that's only $20 more than what it was before. So um, the iCloud storage for the Gmail account is $30, and I guess that will just continue. Um, one, plan one, question, one question with that, it, because I don't know, you have you control the Gmail account? I wish I, I need to get some more information on it. We do have a Gmail account, and it's the Reading Planning Commission or something. Um, I can send a text to that. I sent out a test. I'm having trouble accessing it. I have the password, but I don't know how to get to it to have it ask me what the password is. Because probably it's like dual authentication that Steve has. Somebody has a, another way of... Okay, I will get back, to, uh, go back to Steve. He I gave think, me the password and everything. I think Gene was the one who said that. Okay. Well, because, and, and maybe, because, because and Steve was all the time checking it because he could read when I sent the test mm -hmm. and he, he responded, what are you testing? <laughs> so he there. could read it. I didn't know how to get it to read it. So he needs to maybe give me some more instructions about how all that happens. He they, set me up on it. I didn't have an issue, but something happened with Kathy and. and no, that was the, that was a, the PC core group. It was a PC core group. I, oh, I thought that's the same thing. I was just wondering you if. No, this is the PC, um, the Reading PC email. So if somebody has a question for the oh, the, the commission, so oh. yeah, so on the in the town website, there's a, a mm -hmm. Gmail address, which is hunky It would be nice if I knew how to get in it. I was just wondering with with that amount, uh, you know, whether or not we should up it with the idea that maybe do we have a full Google account where we can have like, do you know Google Drive or Google Docs? I don't or, have a clue. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm wondering like, because some of the... I know, know there was an issue with some of the space when we were doing just Zoom before and then it would go somewhere but we were running out of space right. and so we needed more space and that's how this $30 came about so that we would have enough space but I think it was particularly geared to the Zoom stuff. It was geared to the recorded meeting Yeah, right. and that was taking up a lot of space Right. so we had to keep but now that Okemo Valley TV is doing it. But I'm just wondering if there is if there is a way to have something a little more comprehensive so all these documents that we're emailing each other are all on one place that like we can you know, we can access at any point. And we'll That's a wonderful idea, Mark. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm happy to. Now, are you a Google person? Setting it up. Somewhat, but uh, yeah. Um, okay. It just might be something that then we all have the same login credentials so we can just see everything. And it would also yeah. be great for transparency, too. So. What, amongst each other? Yeah. or? Oh, okay. Yeah, I just. I did, but not public, <laughs> obviously. No. Okay. okay, so it, it just. From what you know about it, is thirty dollars enough for that? I don't have a clue about that stuff. Okay. I don't know, but I, I would say I would say ask Kai, and you know what, 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 what's the I don't know. Oh yeah, we have the next one. Well, no, I just only because we went through this recently, but for yes. a, as a nonprofit, as the um, as I think a municipal entity would fall under that. Um, you could do a Google Workspace for nonprofits, and it's free. And so you can okay. get unlimited amount of email addresses and manage your Google Drive and all that stuff like, under that. Okay. Just thought, so. Okay. So uh, do we it, want to take out this thirty dollars, or do we just want to leave it in in case we need it? My only concern is we've had a, it, it's taken an act of Congress to even get to the the, the storage space before. So I'm yep. wondering if maybe we should just be independent and do our own thing as opposed to having it go through the town office. That's been. Okay. If we so have to do sell, we want to keep the thirty dollars in? Yes. For the for the iCloud storage. I think, I think Mark was saying at least thirty dollars. I would say fifty. Let's 50? just anticipate a little extra. And do we want do we want to say it's for two hundred gigabytes, or do you suspect that it will be more, 
Or do no, we I need to be more cloud specific? Cloud storage for what and it is? document management. Document management. Okay, just for cloud storage and PC document management. For... Okay, um, planning grant mar uh, match. And that's what we were working, what we're working with Martha for now. I don't know, um, it's already in this year's budget for our first grant request. Is that like for next year's or a future? Do you have any idea? I don't think your match is gonna be due until the end of the process. 2025. Okay. Right. Yeah. So that, and that would be, we're gonna have to keep that then, that would be the same. The match is going to be 783. Uh -huh. it's, usually, it's generally 10%, but maybe which is. This is 50%. It says oh, okay. uh, planning grant match 50% of 1566. Okay, so they're putting one half of it in one year and half in the next. So. Okay. Okay, so that's what it is. So we do need to keep that in there for the next half. Okay. Um, training and seminars, we got $300, and that would be anything that comes from like VLTC that somebody wants to go to, um, one of those trainings, and there are two rates, and Callista says that we can use the lower rate. Right. Um, Typically, what do these cost? Because I haven't found anything I'm interested um, in, but they're appropriate. But. Under the lower rate, it's like maybe $30. Okay. And the higher rate is maybe $80. And some of them are a little bit more expensive, a little bit less expensive, but in that ballpark. Um, the one I did was 20. And how many generally do you end up doing a year? It probably varies. Depends, because they offer all different things. Some of the things are of no interest to us. So, so in the past, have you ever maxed out over $300? Not, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Do you feel comfortable with that, or do you think it should be more? I think it's important work. Maybe ask a little more. You want to go to 350? Sure. There's something coming up, by the way. I think it's on the 17th. Um, yes, that's the thing that came out. No, uh, there's something tomorrow. I think I well, printed there is it out. something tomorrow on River Corridors that Mark. Yeah, yeah River Corridors are tomorrow. That's tomorrow night at six. You can come in person or you can come by a Zoom if you if you can make it if you if you're interested. Um, but also on the seventeenth, I believe there's something that VLCT is doing, and I'll I'll send that out. Thank you. I I saw. I didn't know if it applied to us or not. So I I deleted it. Um, and then there was 350 for a contingency fund. Okay. So, are we happy with that? Mm -hmm. I you want me to add it up just to, to sure. it so that we have it for the minutes? And last year was the first year that there, that there was a proposed budget like this. Um, I think prior it was sort of like non-existent. We have uh, 2,463. That's only $63 more than, no, $43 more than Oh, I think, sorry, no, we, sorry, because that's, I didn't, um, oh, it, 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 sorry, I just, I added 60, 65, sorry, 65. 65, 65, 500? Yeah, I didn't do that, so that's 780, sorry. And then 50, 783, 350, 350. Oh.
the October 17th is the home 2023 home act. It's ten dollars for a member. That's 9:30 a.m. on October 17th. 2,590. 2,900 and 590. 590. So not a big increase. No. Um, and what I'll do is I will go ahead and work this up and we can approve it in November and then it goes to the select board. Discussion plan for November meeting, November sixth. Does that work for everybody? Um, We're still doing Zoom, right? Yes. This is November sixth. Six. It's a Monday. First okay. Monday in November. Property taxes. <laughs> oh, that'll be a fun day. <laughs> Kurt, that work for you? Yeah, it should. Stacy? Yeah, absolutely. Mark? Yes. Jane? Yeah, Martha? Other business. I had a question. Uh, whenever, kind of just at least a year ago, when they had an artificial game and the mm -hmm. agency all came in about that proposal, uh, they kind of said that some generous donation first, but uh, this meeting went on. They're, they're going to give like $1.25 million or something to Mandy Hall for it. And we had discussions about, you know, whether the timber rights would be retained or transferred and got all that answered. But I called out there for months and never got anybody to call me back. Um, have you heard anything? I haven't. All I know is no, at one time it was floated around as a donation and then all of a sudden there was money attached to it. Yeah. A beautiful amount, yeah. It was mm -hmm. sold at market value. It was yeah, they bought it at market value. Yeah. Was, that's what we were told. So it wasn't a donation. But I, you know, they had a map on the screen that night that wasn't real clear and, you know, had overlays and stuff. And I think the Planning Commission should have a map of that thing. So I had questions about whether all the land, you know, if it's on um, Grasshopper Road, let's say, up in there, is what he's getting paid for come all the way to the road? Or would he be allowed to, you know, have a 200-yard buffer so that he still couldn't get on it? But what, your question is about the access to that? And has yeah. this, the, the transfer has already gone through? No, I don't know. I mean, I can't get. We don't even know if the transfer has gone through. Who were? Um, I think we, in, in order to get more details to be clear on this instead of throwing things around, is we should contact whomever gave us the presentation. It was a, a man and a woman, right? If I remember correctly, yes. and they did have very detailed maps. Yeah. There was never anything mentioned with a, a setback or. or or areas that couldn't be accessed that, that okay, was delivered to us. In their map, they had a little area that they were keeping. Mm. On a couple of them. Oh. Mm. But I think we, if we go to those two people, if we can figure out who go made that presentation. I think I have the names of them. That would be great. Then, then that would that be the time. person to contact Kurt, and then you could get all the details from them. Jane's going to go back and look in the notes and she'll let us know who, who those speakers were. Okay. Do you want to 
you remember what meeting it was? November? No. What, which meeting was it? Do you remember? It, it was, it was, it was, it was I think it was spring, year. wasn't it? Early spring, late winter? I'll check I actually think it was. Yeah. I think it was in the winter because I watched. I was in. I was abroad and I, I watched it. The recording when it was posted. The fish and wildlife people were very excited about it, though. Yeah. What's there not to be excited? If you can't find it, that might be a place to start, is to call Fish and Wildlife. Yeah, we can dig it out. But I know I have it. Okay. I probably have it here. Can we you just go back on our agendas, even we can look it up. Kurt, is there any specific information we're hoping to gain? I'm just, I'm just curious. Yeah, I'd like to have that map. Okay. We could have it in our possession, talk about it, and look at it, and uh, see where it might Overlap with future, you know, proposals for private land around it or whatever. So, if we still have the Zoom meeting, the map is on the Zoom meeting too. I mean, it's not an official map, but. Well, I do know they were listed as a presenter on our agenda. So, if we just go back month by month on the agenda, we can narrow it down that way. Okay, well, Jane looks for that. Do we have any other business? The only, I just wanted to um, kind of set it out now that we're all together, this, um, this checklist, the inf information checklist for uh, applications uh, that Kathy did. Um, we discussed that briefly <clears throat> right before the meeting and she would like to get all of our responses on, on that checklist and ideas so we could discuss it at the next meeting. I'll put together what you're suggesting to have, if there's something that you think needs to be added or deleted or whatever, and then we can get that going. Anything else? Um, and just that last week I attended, uh, Martha was there with a um, presentation from the, um, from the state about um, uh, flood um, bylaws and mitigation and I would encourage anyone to go online and uh, attend some of these presentations. Uh, I was the only representative from Reading um, there and just just in terms of the Reader's Digest version, um, it's all about river corridor protection, don't build closer than what's already there, leave room for rivers, special flood hazard area, no net fill, the lowest floor should be two feet above flood water, let floodplains work for all of us. Don't increase the risk for those already at risk. And um, just in uh, driving around town, there's a lot of there's a lot of activity. There's a lot of berm construction. There's a lot of uh, cleaning out uh, the rivers. Um, and um, we all attended, or some of us attended, a, one of the select board meetings about um, you know what the state is asking. Right now, the, the town has a pretty good, I'm going to call it credit rating, but right now, because we have all of these plans in place and we're going to get the optimal amount of money from state and federal um, support, but uh, if we are allowing some of these things to happen, we might be jeopardizing our future payout, and uh, it should be a concern for everyone in this room. Um, so yeah. I just... Yeah, yes, Kurt. No. Yeah, that's why. Just look at down below Hall's property. You know, once you get down where the river, you can see the flood bed now is really wide, and there's that new little waterfall there. Um, that helps disperse future floods, and I think all that shit should be maintained. Excuse me, stuff should be maintained. Um, and, and I did see something, a and &R had some guidelines about even pulling brush and trees and stuff out of the river. Um, they're not for that in every case at all. 
Yeah, I think it's important to know that we, as a planning commission, spent a lot of time developing those plans, and we did it under the guidance of the town and the people in the town being able to recoup the maximum amount of reimbursement from FEMA and the state organizations. And if we get lax on those things, we could possibly lose that. And that would certainly hurt a lot of people who were affected by this last go-round. And the two representatives from the state that gave the presentation um, essentially said that uh, if, if any community members have any concerns, we do have a, we do have a local contact within the state that's, that's, take, that's assigned to writing and taking care of this, but that ultimately it's up to the select board to um, enforce the state guidelines. So um, I'm going to, uh, just as a concerned resident, bring it up at uh, next week's select board meeting, but I think other people should also express some of these concerns. I'm wondering if it would be worth having some of the state people um, attend or see if they could make it to the select board meeting. You planning on doing it for the next select board meeting? Like I, next I, week? I emailed the select board and Calista today to be added to the agenda. Um, no response as of now. Marie Caduta was at the that select board meeting. She was the one that, you know, settled the things about the waterways that they didn't want like no metal in the water, don't remove the trees. Sure. Like that, so. And as of now, um, I know that there is some discussion about emergency permits that could be granted, but as of now on the state's website, there's only one permitted, uh, you know, only one permit, um, and that's for the, the talc uh, operation up in Hammondsville that has been granted a permit of some sort from the state, but no other property owner has as of now. So whatever is happening is not necessarily permitted. Well, that spillway permit for the um, Windsor Mineral Mine, um, which is a neighbor of mine, mm -hmm. um, that was way before the flood. And, and that's just a preventive maintenance. Sure, but it's, it's the only current one that's in, that's in the system that's, that, that, that has a, a state permit around. I can't around believe that Marie, you know, being a neighbor, wouldn't be very well aware of everything that's going on in the 106 core. I just, I, I would think she would be precisely aware, to be honest. But it sounds like it's ultimately up to it's up to the town to to maintain and police what the state statutes are around. That's a good question. I think asking it at the meeting, at the select board meeting, is appropriate. Mm -hmm. I might. My concern about all of this, um, speaking of that specific issue, is has anyone brought up to the state why they aren't widening that bridge and getting rid of the critical constraint? By the by, the villa by the whole art, right. art foundation. I, I think it's I think it's a concern. I think it's really far down. I, I think this was referenced at one of the meetings. It's really low on the totem pole right. in terms of right. existing infrastructure projects, projects that are already there. You know, I think they're aware of it, but it, it's not going to happen anytime soon. So, back to my comment. Maybe yes. you could get somebody from the state sure. to to come and, and uh, do the presentation with you. Okay. And that could either Great be. Job. That would be great. Um, Scott Jensen or Brooke Campbell, John Brooke Campbell. Yes, he, he was one of the presenters. Anything else? Not for me. Card? No. Stacy? No. Public comments? Did we answer None? your questions right? Or no? What, what else would you like clarification on? No, I, I don't have anything. Oh, okay. So we answered your question. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we have 30 more minutes. You want to get back to Martha? Oh. All of this. Huh? Huh? I think it's, I think it's worth, probably worthwhile. This is taking, it's taking some time. Okay. Okay.
closed everything down. Um, where were we? We were discussing the owner occupied. I think that's where we left off. Would you like to um, just put that on hold for now and look at parking? Um, <laughs> or no? No. <laughs> I feel like this is okay. a little. No. Um, Is there other wordings in any of these in these bylaws that you know like, where there's some sort of asterisk where it says you know essentially you know maybe an ADU doesn't need to be owner occupied but you know all all ADUs that are a part of state local federal funding you know um, you know must comply with this is the language. Right here on the screen. Um, so, except for flood hazard and fluvial erosion area bylaws adopted pursuant to section 4424 of this title, no bylaw shall have the effect of excluding as a permitted use one accessory dwelling unit that is located within or pertinent to a single family dwelling on an owner occupied lot. So they're telling you what you can't do. Mm -hmm. So if you want, like I said, if you want to be more permissive or if you want to allow that as a permitted use and then if the lot is not owner occupied to allow it <coughs> as a conditional use I mean there are options there depending on what you're interested in doing I mean you can strike the owner occupied and just allow accessory dwellings that are within or pertinent to a single family dwelling. I agree with that. That's one option. The other option, I mean, uh, one other option is the conditional use thing. Conditional use conflicts with the states. Pardon? The conditional use would conflict with the state, correct? No, I mean, if you said exactly what they say, that um, if it's on, if it's pertinent to a single family dwelling on an owner occupied lot, it's permitted. If it's pertinent to a single family dwelling on a lot that's not owner occupied, it's conditional. That, that would be fine with the state. Or you can just, like I said, get rid of owner get rid of owner occupied and allow every single family dwelling to have an ADU, whether it's owner occupied or not. Well, I think that plays into trying to solve the affordable housing situation more than creating the limitation of owner occupancy. I mean, I guess one benefit, I mean, what, as Jane was saying, you know, what are the pros and cons of owner occupancy? What would be the, um, what would prevent someone who is not occupying their home, and let's say they have rented their home, and so let's say it's been a long-term rental. Let's say the people have been there for five or six years now. The renters. 
they're still renters. Mm -hmm. What's going to prevent a renter, if they have a single family dwelling, to putting in an ADU? They couldn't. Why the not? The owner of the property controls what can and cannot be done. And if somebody applies for an addition or an ADU to create an ADU, they can't do that without the owner's permission. Hmm. Like a renter could walk into the office, create an app, or fill out an application saying, I'm going to add on to this house to create an ADU. That's, that's not possible unless somebody really drops the ball. I think there's also the piece that I, I, it's almost like you create the, the ADU for the, for, the, for the rental purpose, you live in the main house, I guess regardless of whether the person is there full time, but that it's not two housing units next to each other that are both rented. Does that seem that that's more of the thing that people are resistant on, that there's just a whole property that's all I, rental? I think and how is that different than just having a house that you rent in a long term? I think, I mean, I think that is some concern, you know, that if the, per, if the person who owns the property lives right next door, there's probably going to be some uh, control, I guess, over the ADU in terms of mm -hmm. noise and parking and garbage. And, That's valid. You know, I mean. I mean, I, I kind of feel at this point, if you're adding an ADU and you're truly owner-occupied, then you're eligible for some of the incentives, the tax breaks, the grants, and then you have a whole set of rules that are coming to you from, you know, the outside agencies that are putting those, I'm just going to call them deed restrictions, but putting those restrictions in place. But I, I just feel like if you're going to create ADUs, you know that that aren't receiving that aren't receiving those incentives. How how can they legally how can we legally regulate them and say that you know they have to be rented long term? You have to have an owner occupied situation. Well, the state well the state is saying that giving you that opportunity to, with the owner occupancy. I mean that's in the law. And they also say, um, I don't know if I have it here, but there's language that allows you to be less, I mean, it basically says you can, you can still regulate short-term rentals. Doesn't, you know, doesn't mention long. You can regulate short-term rentals separately from residential rentals is how they put it. So they don't give a ton of guidance. I mean, they define short-term rental mm -hmm. and they allow towns to regulate them. Okay. Um, and now lots of different towns are doing lots of different things mm -hmm. and it's probably gonna get sorted out in the courts, you know, because <laughs> people who don't like what's happening are, are gonna, you know, pursue it legally. I mean, I guess that's already happening in Burlington and, all over the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, going, going back to the owner occupied, which on one hand, you I can see it both ways. You want the owner to be there if there's an accessory. But if the owner is only there 50%, that means that that isn't their primary thing. They are, don't have kids going to the local school. So isn't it better than to rent out their house? to somebody who will live there and send their kids to school. You know what I'm saying? That that rather than it be just a vacation home for somebody, if they, uh, you know, so that would dispel the owner occupancy, that you don't need that, you know, for the accessory dwelling. It doesn't have to be owner occupied because you could, if somebody was renting that, the, the, re the residence, and the accessory dwelling, that's twice as many people coming in than having somebody who's only there part-time. Well, I believe there's example after example of, of people having, currently having ADUs 
that have caretakers or part-time employees or or you know family who have children they necessarily don't live there full-time but they have families living in one of their ADUs that have children going to school at, in Reading or Woodstock and there's dozens of examples of that. I mean if you want to encourage more of them to be long-term rentals instead of number five saying neither the single family home or the accessory dwelling unit is offered as a short-term rental, you, you could say, you know, provided that either the home or the ADU is occupied by a resident, it doesn't have to be a, the owner, you know, it could be a renter. Well, I would separate the STRs from that because right. I do believe that it should be owner-occupied if you have an STR because you need someone there to kind of like make sure that you know they're not too noisy and they're not having just parties all the time blah, blah, you know that i'm just just hypothetically okay i'm just saying that maybe take the language out for the accessory what that that has to be owner occupied if the accessory dwelling you know for the accessory dwelling to be a rental property a long-term rental not a short-term rental right so maybe instead of on an owner occupied lot it would say on an occupied a, a lot occupied by the owner or a full time agent rental um, but then would they be eligible for any of the funds to help out with the building of the ADU if it's not our resident? Well, that's not managed by us. That's managed by the state program. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that doesn't have anything to do with our zoning. I mean, I think the owner could still, if the, the owner of the property wants to create an ADU, they can probably apply for that grant and create the ADU. I don't think, I don't know, but I don't think that has anything to do with It doesn't. Whether, yeah. I think that, I think it, they wouldn't allow it to be short-term rental, the ADU. No, they situation. don't, for the five-year period. Right, right. So do we want owner-occupied lot? Mark? So uh, so still, still, still processing. Kurt? Owner-occupied lot, you say? Yes, do we want that in there or not? Yeah, similar. Stacy? No. Well, we can't even come to a conclusion, I guess. That's <laughs> <laughs> what happened a half hour ago. <laughs> okay, so we're going to revisit that one. I guess just so I have a sense. <laughs> If the owner occupied was removed, and it just said accessory dwelling unit is located within or pertinent to a single family dwelling, period, how many, is there any consensus on that? I mean, I'd have to think about it. Okay. Likewise. Accessory apartments. That was your, your old language, was the accessory apartments. So the proposal is to replace that with this accessory. Say that again. What about um, accessory apartments is your old language or your current language? Okay. That's being replaced by 
the proposed <laughs> to be replaced by this accessory dwelling unit language. Okay. Uh, number five about short-term rentals. Do you want to scratch that? Is there an agreement to scratch that? What's the what's under ADUs? You said it was five. Okay, thanks. Where is it? It's hard. It's, uh, number five. It's um, hard without page numbers. On. Yeah, it's if it, it, you flip the page that's about parking. It's right above it. Parking requirements. Yeah, it's. Um, Still, what we're looking at there—that's one that has reunion may or may may be attached or detached. But this shall be only one accessory unit per lot. Everybody good with that one? And I think yes, that just yes. goes back to the other thing where the one that we were with before about no bylaw, blah blah blah. It says only one per lot anyway. To a single family dwelling on an owner occupied winter before that. Excluding as a permitted use one accessory dwelling unit that is located. So that's limited by that. So I think two is okay. Anybody object to two? That's what's in our current. Yes. Yeah. Number two is five. Yeah. No, this is under the proposed language. Yes, and I'm saying number two. Four point one number two. Yes, number two is fine. Attached or detached. Okay. Yeah, it's the same. One yeah. eighty per door. Yeah. You go with that? Yep. Okay. Number three, the owner of the property may occupy either the single family dwelling or the accessory dwelling unit. We go with that? That'll probably hinge on the owner so. yeah. occupancy. Exactly. Well, yeah, right. because it goes to the owner of the property. So that's going to have to revisit. I think we have to, since we're, I'm going to breeze by this really quick, but I think we have to keep an open mind about people's circumstances change too. So where one does own, is an owner occupied today in four, five, or six years based on something unforeseeable then they can't be an owner occupied property. So just, just food for thought while we're just we're Give me a scenario. Some job, job relocation. Yeah. Or, family or sick that you have to know. Handicap okay. or car accident. Or, and then what happens? Well that's that if you are if you become more restrictive then it limits people's changes of circumstance. You would have to pick the person out of the ADU because the owner can no longer occupy the home. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you. How can we reward re 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 that? Well, if you don't require them. Well, it just says may occupy. May is the operative word there. Right. So I'm okay with that. If it was must, that would be a different category. Right. This is a may. Good point. Yeah. So good I'm point. good with that. Um, four, accessory dwelling unit is not located in a special flood hazard area or river corridor. Everybody good with that? Yes. Yeah? Kurt? Yes. Kurt's gone. Okay. 
<laughs> Kurt's chair said it was okay. Number five, neither the single family home nor the accessory dwelling unit is offered as a short term rental and that means and we go on to number six. They're all, no, they're all, it's a whole list. It's just inclusive. It's and because all, that's, that's all that. applicable requirements of these regulations and the dimension requirements for the zoning district in which the ADU is located are met. Mm -hmm. I think it was five that was the number five. Was one. The and, you know, I mean, I be, before I was working, or when I first started working with you all, I think you mentioned that you had drafted a short term rental ordinance for the select board to consider. Yeah, and they were going to get back to us. They said that they would several months ago, they were going to get back to us, and we haven't heard squat since. I mean, ideally, just from everything I hear, the ordinances are a better way to go than to put uh, short-term rentals into your zoning regulations. I, I don't even think it was a matter of the ordinance. I think the thing, only thing that was being considered was the was registration. Was a draft. Well, right? we, we just, just gave them a draft and we said, look at this draft and get back to us with your thoughts. And right. they never did. And then it came up again and they said, well, we didn't like what you said. So the point is then tell us what you're good with, what you're not good with and get it back to us. And they said, oh, okay, we're going to do that. Mm -hmm. And crickets. All right. So I'm just suggesting that, you know, if you remove this and just allow anything that has to do with short-term rentals to be governed by what a registry or ordinance or whatever the select board is going to do or not going to do, then it kind of just removes that whole topic from this. Right, yes. I agree. I agree too. And what you're saying is so you could strike number five. Yeah. I would strike, and, number five. Uh, strike the whole thing? Yes. And then and would be at four and then we'd move on to six would become five. All applicable requirements of these regulations. Anybody have a problem with that? No. No. Okay. Kurt, you good with the uh, number six? The requirements uh, for the ADUs on that? Yeah, I think I'm okay with that. Okay. And, uh, just one thing. Kurt, were you here to know that we're striking number five? Oh, uh, I just came back from the nature calls. No, you ought to. You ought to just. You ought to come up to speed on that one. You might feel differently. Yeah. That's I'm fine cool. believing it personally, but. You know. So Mar Martha was saying maybe once we do have a short-term ordinance that the select board approves, that maybe just that ordinance takes care of the aspects of STRs that we may or may not want to regulate but just not have it connected to the issue of ADUs. If, if, if ADUs are going to be constructed and they're going to be, there's going to be protective covenants because of, you know, grants already, that's going to supersede anything that we've, that, that, that's already protected it from short-term rentals. But if somebody is paying market value to build an ADU at $300,000, we, one of the, items that we discussed, I think, was having, if we are going to have short-term rentals in town, that it needs to be owner-occupied, and that answers that, that question. That's in your ordinance, in the draft ordinance, that the short-term No, there's no draft ordinance. No, I thought it was just a registration. Yeah. Well, it could be a small registering could registering be. the short No, what we gave them was a draft. It, and it wasn't just suggesting a registry. It suggested a number of things. Right, it did. Well, but it was not an ordinance. The ordinance would, you'd probably need an ordinance to establish a registry, is what I'm saying. I don't um, know what, it, I haven't seen it. I okay. What it I think whatever, whatever I thought the select board wanted to do, that it could be, Changeable. They wanted to not have it be embedded in the zoning 
ordinance, but it was going to be a, I don't know what the, the lexicon. They want the zoning, then they wanted a standalone one. So we got one and then they just blew it off. They wanted an ordinance and then they said we should write the ordinance because they felt that an ordinance is easier to change than us putting it in the zoning. An ordinance and then they said we should write the ordinance because they felt that an ordinance is easier to change than us putting it in the zoning. Yes. And that's what we went with and then it just sort of went in a circular file somewhere. Okay, so back to the point we are discussing whether or not... So, to... number five, they want to omit five about the short-term rental until we hear back from the select board with their thoughts on the draft that we sent them for the law for the short-term rentals. And my battery died, that's why. It's no longer on the screen. <laughs> One minute left. Kurt? You're going to ask them to look at the standalone ordinance we already did? And no, what we did. Yes, that was what it was. It was a draft that we sent to them and we asked them for their comments. Right, and so we just need to keep after them, I guess, to give I, us their comments and send it back to us. I mean, just as an audience member when I was at those meetings, I think if we really want to be serious about short-term rentals, I think that we need to, I, I think it needs to be tweaked, I think it needs to be represented. I also think there was never any sort of public presentation that we're working with Mark, there are all these studies about the threats of short-term rentals, and they need to make it relevant. They just see it as being a regulation on top of a regulation, and one of the members of the select board is an active member of the short-term rental community, so we're going to have to be a little more creative and thoughtful with the presentation, because my understanding was they weren't going to look at the draft, they had already thrown it away. Steve was supposed to go and make a presentation and he never went to the meeting and he said, oh, it was just meant for comments. They threw it away. And now Bob is, Bob Hartnett is thinking of re, re introducing it mm -hmm. and both Robert Allen and Gordy Eastman just looked at him and didn't say anything. So I think if we're really serious about this and it's a part of, it's a part of, you know, the, the, the bylaw modernization grant, we're supposed to be, Mm -hmm. it it's not. I, I was reading all these things that I thought were supposed to be addressing. Yes, but not the short-term rentals. No. All you need to do is address it, and we are addressing it. I think there's. I. I mean, I, I think that there are some points that 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 you know are are that have merit, and some that I think you know we're chasing something that doesn't exist. But anyway, that's my. That's my two cents. I think the I think the select board has long since thrown it out. So if if we want them to reconsider it, we need to have some a fresh approach and actually go to the meeting and actually collectively present it, and not just send them an email because that's not how it works. Let's get it on Zoom. Let's get it out there, and at least we can say, you know, we tried. Do we and want this to have put that on our agenda for next month? I think, you know, just, you do have a limited amount of time to work on your zoning regulations, mm -hmm. and that a short-term rental ordinance would be outside of that work. Okay. So, it would, it would be great if, you know, After know we do the, we stay do focused. If you, if you, okay. Um, so, stay okay. focused, we're back to this point five. Get rid of it, or... Or set aside some separate time during each meeting to talk with the short term rental. Yeah, either that. Uh, so I'm going to. Um, at first, I said we could delete it. I'm, I am no longer in favor of deleting it. So you wanted it deleted. Stacy wanted it deleted. Kurt said no. And I said no. So it's a tie right now. So. I guess it just is in limbo. That's number five, right? Yep. Number five. 
And it's 9.03. Do I hear a motion to move? Mm -hmm. Is there any public, did we already address public comment? Mm -hmm. yeah. We asked. Okay, I thought that was the last. Yeah. Adjourn. Motion. Oh. Second. 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 Stacy second. Um, I have the names here. Oh.